Let me just ask, how many have a burden on your heart today? Something that, that God knows what's on your heart. And so uh, God knows. Let's, let's pray and let's lay all that out to him. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you've told us that we can boldly come to the throne of grace and present our petitions to you. Father, we confess we don't pray as we ought. We don't pray as often as we should. And Lord, as James says, we often pray selfishly. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be men and women of prayer. We lift up our sister Martha in prayer. And God, I just pray that you'd be with her this morning. Lord, I pray you'd help her to sense your presence and your power. And we cry out to you as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And we pray that you would touch her body and we pray that you would heal her. Thank you that Tim is doing so much better and Tim was able to sing today. And Lord, we pray for others in our church family that are struggling, that aren't able to be here. I know we have many of our families out of town today. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with them as they're traveling. Lord, help us to learn from your word today. Lord, as we study the importance of praying scripture, help us to understand what it means to take the word of God and pray the very words of God. Make us men and women of prayer. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bible, your, your, your phone, your iPad, whatever you have, turn with me to Psalm 13. Psalm 13, in just a few moments, we're going we're gonna to dig into the six verses that make up the 13th Psalm. But let me ask you a, just a pointed question this morning. Have you ever wanted to complain to God? Seriously. I mean, you felt like something happened in your life or something happened in your life and you felt like God did you wrong. You might verbalize it and say, man, I got shafted on this one. I got taken advantage of. Maybe you prayed and asked God to do something and he didn't do it. Or, or maybe you prayed and asked God that something wouldn't happen and it did happen. Or maybe something happened to you in a way that you felt like, man, you know what? I just didn't deserve that. And you wanted to just cry out and complain to God. Often we don't do that because we think, oh my word. And I've had people tell me, Brian, I can't talk to God that way. And I think there's... There's three reasons why we don't complain to God. The first is, and I think the first is a good reason, is we fear that it would be disrespectful. And, and none of us want to be disrespectful to uh, God, to an omnipotent, omniscient, loving, compassionate God. And so at times we're afraid to verbalize what's on our hearts. I think another reason why we don't complain to God, quite frankly, is we have it too good. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, we live in probably the best, if not one of the best countries of the world. And the poorest, the poorest of us today have more than the majority of the people of the world. And quite frankly, we are very seldom in a position where we feel like we just can't make it. We have it too good. Sometimes I wonder what our spiritual life would be like if God would take away many of the things that we have. I think a third reason why we don't complain and share our hearts to God is we have a tendency to pretend like everything's okay. And we don't want to admit when we're struggling. We probably do that even at church at times. You walk in, you might have a burden on your heart. You might be struggling in your marriage. You might be struggling in your job. And someone asks you how you're doing, and our natural response is, great. I'm doing great. We put a mask on, and we pretend as if everything is okay, but it's really not okay. On the inside, we're hurting. On the inside, we're aching. We're struggling. And at times, that affects our faith as well. And we not only put a mask on to other people, but for some reason, we put a mask on and we pretend when we're talking with God as if everything is okay. Not really that, 
not realizing that God not only hears the words that we say, but God knows the very thoughts and the intents of our hearts. And God knows what we are thinking before we ever say it. During the summer, we are studying the prayers of the Bible. And the purpose for us to go through and study many of these prayers of Scripture is for us to truly learn how to pray. Quite frankly, there are times when we don't know what to pray. There are times when we don't know what to say. We are uncertain what we should even ask God for. In those moments, we can use the Bible as our guide. Someone gave me this quote this week. Uh, I love it. And it's a quote by Beth Moore. Uh, I'm sure the ladies are familiar with Beth Moore, but Beth Moore makes this statement. She says, when you pray God's word out loud, you may hear your own voice, but the devil hears God's voice. In other words, when we take the words of Scripture and we pray the very words of Scripture, we might be vocalizing them, we might be verbalizing them with our own voice, but we are speaking the very words of God. I would submit to you today that there is nothing wrong with telling God how you feel. I would remind you, when we, when we hurt ourselves physically, what do we do? We cry out in pain. If you hit your hand or your finger with a hammer, you might cry out, ouch, right? Hopefully that's what you'd cry out, right? <laughs> ouch! You might say something. You would verbalize the fact that you just experienced pain. Well, I'd submit to you this morning that when we hurt spiritually, And there are times when we hurt spiritually. There are times when we don't understand what God is doing. There are times when we struggle even with what God is doing in our lives. When you and I hurt spiritually, we should cry out in what the Bible calls lament. So today I want to talk about something that quite frankly in 35 years, I've been preaching for 35 years, I have never in 35 years preached on the subject. This is new to me, and I'll give you my own personal testimony at the end of the message and the journey that has brought me to this point. But the Scripture is filled with laments. Some have said that as many as 50% to to 70% of the Psalms are lament Psalms. There's actually a book of the Bible called Lament. We're familiar with what? Lamentations. Lamentations is just one long lament to God. Let me define, if you have your outline in front of you, I've given you a little bit more of an extensive outline today, but I've defined lament as this. It's a form of prayer to God that expresses sorrow, grief, but ultimately faith. Let me say it again. It's a form of prayer that expresses sorrow, it expresses grief, It expresses hurt. It expresses doubt. But it's a form of prayer that doesn't lead us away from God. It's a form of prayer that leads us closer to Him. It's a form of prayer that results in faith. We struggled this week as to what lament psalm we would read. And we settled on Psalm 13. I trust it will be a blessing to you. So if you have your Bibles in front of you, we're going to put it up on the screen. I want to read these six verses. And we're going to dissect these six verses as David cried out to God. He lamented. He complained to God. And we'll see how David did this and how it applies to our life. So Psalm 13, beginning in verse 1, notice what David says. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul? How long, or excuse me, and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me. Verse 3, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Notice verse 5, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord 
because he has done bountifully with me. So this is one of those psalms, many of the psalms we know the context. Many of the psalms we know what was taking place in the psalmist's life when he wrote that psalm. But this is one of those psalms that we don't know exactly when the psalm was written. We don't know, we know that David wrote it, but we don't know when it was written at what point in David's life. We don't know what motivated him to write the psalm. It could be the repeated prayer of David's heart as he experienced a life filled with trials. And if you're familiar with David's life, you know that he went through periods in, in which he was on the run, that he didn't know whether he was going to live or die, and he, and he cried out to God. And many believe that this was just a prayer that David repeated to God over and over again. The psalm has often been referred to as the how long psalm. Because the four questions found in the first two verses, how long, as we'll see in a moment, David asked that question four times, how long, O Lord? This psalm, though, does provide a pattern for us as to how you and I can lament, how you and I can cry out to God. I want to give you three practical, yet I believe extremely biblical truths that we can pull from this psalm and others. The first is this. You can be honest with God. I just want that to kind of sink into your mind and your heart today. You can be honest with God. So I mentioned a few moments ago, four times, David asked the question, how long? And, and the first question in my mind is somewhat accusatory that David addresses to the Lord. He says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? In a, in a display of bold audacity, David accuses the Lord of having forgotten him. Let me pause for a second and ask you, have you ever felt that way? Has there ever been a time in your life when you thought, God, where are you? I'm crying out to you, and, and I don't get a response. Have you ever thought that God had forgotten who you were? That, that maybe for some reason he had forgotten your name. And so because he forgot your name, that he's kind of you know, ignored you just a little bit. Have you ever felt like you were neglected? Or maybe even that God abandoned you? If that's the case, you're not alone. That's exactly what David is saying. He gives a very strong accusation to God. God, where are you? God, have you forgotten me? In modern terms, David could be saying, God, I'm calling, but all I'm getting is your voicemail. And, and God, you, you never return my calls. God, you never speak to me. What does that show? What does David's accusation to God show? I put a couple of things in your notes. The first is this, a lament, and that's what David is doing. A lament expresses personal pain in a way that is unrestrained and transparent. A lament expresses personal pain in a way that is unrestrained and transparent. We find this all throughout the Psalms. And David does this maybe more than anyone else. Let me show you a couple. Psalms chapter 10 or Psalm 10 in verse 1. David says, why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? David says, God, why is it that when I'm at the most perilous point in my life, you are nowhere to be found? God, why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 44 in verse 9, David says, You have rejected us. You have disgraced us. You've not gone out with our enemies. Psalm 44 in verse 11, this is, this is just poignant. He says, God, you have butchered us like sheep, and you have scattered us among the nations. What do we find? We find David speaking to God in a way that is unrestrained and transparent. 
You might sit back and say, oh my word, Brian, I would never talk to God that way. I don't want to be disrespectful. Here's what I want you to catch today. That as long as this type of conversation does not affect your faith, God desires for us to be honest and transparent with Him. God wants to know what the burden is on our hearts. God wants to know what the struggles are that we are going through. God wants to know what we are thinking. God wants to know what we are feeling. When we lament, you can express to God what you're feeling in a way that is unrestrained. And you can be totally transparent with God. Let me show you a second thing that we can pull from this. The truth is this. A lament teaches us that there's things we do not understand. A lament teaches us that there's things in life that we don't understand. All of us can relate with this truth. How often does something happen in your life, your family, your job, your community, your country that you don't understand? You lose several family members in the same year. And you say, God, what are you doing? This doesn't make sense. Can't you spread out death a little bit more so that other families are affected? God, I don't understand why you're allowing this to happen to my life. A wife is faithful to her husband for many years and when out of the blue, the husband is unfaithful to her and she cries out, God, God, how could this happen? God, God, I don't understand. I've tried to be the wife, the spouse that that you've wanted me to be, and, and this happens. God, I just don't understand. We see the atrocities that are taking place all around the world. We see the atrocities that are taking place even in our own country, and we want to cry out, God, where are you? God, have you hidden yourself from us? God, have you forgotten us? What are you doing, God? Do you not care? Are you powerful enough to fix this? Or are you not? You see, lament allows us to realize that there are things in God's character. There's things in God's actions that we do not understand. Moses said it this way in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. He said, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Let me just say this, and we struggle with this. But God never promised to give us all the answers. And sometimes we want to sit back and we want to, and, and I'm this type of person, I got to know why. So, so, so I want to know why this is taking place, why this person is thinking this way, why this is happening. And so uh, I, want to, uh, I want to probe, I want to investigate, I want someone to tell me why. And there's things that happen in life that we might not ever understand. Lament demonstrates that for us. There's things that Vicki and I are lamenting in our life, and we still don't understand exactly what God is doing. But we trust that God has a plan. Here's the third thing that I want you to see, and I kind of pull it together right here. Lament, though, is not a failure of faith, but an act of faith. To lament is not a failure of faith, and this is where I think sometimes we struggle, because we think, man, if I really verbalize myself in that way, if I really express to God what I'm thinking, am I being unfaithful? Am I demonstrating a lack of faith? Am I failing in my faith? And here's what I want you to catch. When you are transparent with God, when you bear your soul to a loving, caring God who desires to know you, and by the way, already knows everything about you more than you know yourself. He knows exactly what you're thinking at every moment. When you express yourself to God in that way, it's not a failure of faith, but an act of faith. You see, to share your soul to God is not an act of rebellion. God longs for you to tell him what's on your heart. He longs to to hear from you in a way that is unrestrained and transparent. And by the way, such an action shouldn't drive us away from him. But such an action should drive us toward him. You see, as David repeatedly shared his soul... His faith didn't increase, or excuse me, decrease. 
His faith increased. As David bared his soul to the Lord, he grew stronger and stronger spiritually. Why is that? Because he was conversing with the one who cared. He was conversing with the one who could make changes in his life. Here's the first thing I want you to catch today. You can be honest with God. And I would encourage you to do that. Sometimes our prayers are rehearsed. Sometimes we say the same thing over and over again. And God just longs to have an authentic, real conversation with us. A conversation in which we tell him truthfully what's on our heart. Let me show you a second thing that we see in the psalm. We not only see that you can be honest with God, but we see that you can cry out to God. Notice verse 3, once again, he said, David says to God, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. David simply asked God to grant his wishes. He asked God to answer his requests. We get that, because all of us have petitions. I mean, if I asked you, what are you praying for? You're praying for something. I mean, you're praying either that, you know, God would give you grandkids, or you're praying that God would give you a new job, or, or you're pleading that the Dolphins would make the playoffs this year. I mean, I mean, all of us know what it's like to have a burden on our heart and to present that burden to God. But oftentimes, our requests are generic. And, and, and what we find here as we study the book of Psalms is that David asks for some pretty uh, audacious and presumptuous things in his prayers. Let me show you a couple of things that, that David prays for, and you might gasp when you hear some of these things. Psalm 55 and verse 15. David says, let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go alive to the grave. <laughs> pretty direct, right? Okay, God, pretty much here's what I want you to do. I want you to open up the ground, and I want you to swallow up my enemies. That's what I'm asking you to do. Psalm 58 in verse 6. Oh, God, break their teeth in their mouths. Now, how spiritual of prayer is that? All right? God, break their teeth in their mouths. Notice this, Psalm 69 and verse 28. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. David says, God, here's what I want you to do. I want you to condemn them completely. Send them straight to hell. That's basically what David is praying. Now, I read those and... Those are some bold requests. Those are called imprecatory psalms. Those are, those are cursing psalms in which David asks for things that, that you and I might sit back and gasp. How could a man of God ask such bold requests? And I certainly don't want you to misunderstand the purpose of the message this morning. I'm not freeing, God to, or I'm not freeing you to ask God to kill your husband. I'm not, I'm not freeing you up this morning for God or to ask God to open up the ground and to swallow your neighbors. You know, that neighbor that's driving you crazy and, you know, you know won't turn his music off at 1130 at night. I'm not freeing for you to say, okay, God, here's what I pray. I pray right now you'd open up the ground and swallow my neighbor alive. That's not, that, that's not what... I'm, I'm condoning necessarily this morning. But here's what I do want you to see. And this is what I think sometimes we don't catch. There is no request that is off limits or out of bounds. As we pray, as we express our heart to God, there is no request that is off limits or out of bounds. You say, Brown, what does that look like in my life? What would that look like in yours? You could pray something like this. God, I want my kids to know you. So God, I pray that you would do whatever is necessary to bring my children back to you. Oh, Lord, drive my daughter's boyfriend away from her before he drives her away from you. God, my boss is trying to get rid of me because of my Christian testimony. God, thwart his attempts. And God, if necessary, move him out of the way so I can be where you want me to be. Listen, listen. here's what I want you to catch. 
the, the, there is no request off limits. Now, here, just because you pray it doesn't mean that God's going to do it. But you have the freedom to express your heart and your burden and your requests, whatever they are, to God. Here's the next thing that I wrote down. I wrote down this. God takes pleasure in our asking Him to do things that seem impossible. God takes pleasure in asking Him to do things that seem impossible. Remember when your kids were little, those of you that are my age, and, and you did something in front of your boys? I mean, you know, uh, you know they would, mom would want, you know, the mayonnaise jar opened up, and, you know, you know, little Justin, who was seven or eight, would grab it, and he would try as hard as he could to open it up. And then Mark, four or five, would try as hard as he could to open it up. And all of a sudden, they'd give it to Dad. You do it. And I take the jar, and, you know, in my massive strength, I just kind of open the jar right away. And they're like... Oh my word, look how strong dad is. Listen, God's the same way. God takes pleasure in our asking him to do things that are seemingly impossible. That's what David does repeatedly in his Psalms. He cries out to God, and God doesn't grant all of his requests. I don't think there's any record in history that God literally came down and punched his enemies in the mouth and, and busted out their teeth, all right? I, I don't think God answered those requests literally, but God takes pleasure in us asking those things from him. So let me ask you this morning, what is it that you would really like for God to do in your life? What is your greatest need at this moment? What, what would truly make you happy? Let me encourage you boldly cry out to God and ask God to do what only He is capable of doing. Here's a couple of verses, Jeremiah 32 and verse 17. I love this, all oh, Lord God. It is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And then just 10 verses later, the Lord responds, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And we know that's a rhetorical question because we realize there is nothing too hard for God. You see, whatever obstacle you have in your life, whatever trial you have in your life, whatever problem that you have in your life that seems mountainous at this moment, it seems huge, it seems like the greatest obstacle in the world, it is nothing for God. And God desires for you to cry out to Him and He takes pleasure in answering, if it's according to His will, those requests. Let me show you a third thing. The third thing is this. It is only after acknowledging your pain and asking God for help that you are truly able to heal. Let me say that again. It is only after acknowledging your pain and asking God for help that you are truly able to heal. One of the things that, that we encounter on a regular basis is, is I would venture to say that many people, maybe even some of us here today, maybe many of us here today, are hurt. God's allowed something to happen in our life and we resent it. We, we might not verbalize it. We might not say it. We've probably kept it deep and buried for a long time. It's hindered our relationship with God. And maybe there's something in your life that, that, that God has allowed to happen, something that you experienced, a relationship that was broken, a job that was lost, something that happened in your life, and, and in your heart of hearts, you sit back and you cannot understand why God has allowed that to happen, and deep down, it is affecting your walk with God. Because you sit back and question God. God, I don't want to expose myself to that again. God, I don't want to get hurt like that again. And so we build barriers around ourselves, And we're physically, we are spiritually hurting. So here's one of the things I would share with you. By learning to lament. By learning to bear our soul to God. 
By saying what is un- on our heart in an unrestrained, transparent way. And then crying out to God as the only one who can truly heal our broken hearts. And truly mend that relationship and fix whatever problem it is. That is when we will truly be able to heal in our lives. You can be honest with God. You can cry out to God. Here's a third thing that David shows us. You can trust God. You see, David's pain and his complaint didn't drive him away from God. David's pain and his complaint turned into trust. His lament didn't lead him away from God, but it it led him towards God. It deepened David's faith. Notice what David says in verse 5. He says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. That word steadfast love, we see it in English, and it doesn't carry near the weight that it carries in Hebrew. The Hebrew word is hesed. It is God's covenant love. The ESV translates it God's loyal love. David is saying, God, even when you do things in my life that I don't understand, that I don't like, I trust in the fact that you are doing it out of love for me. I trust in your steadfast love. Simple illustration that many of us have probably experienced. When I was was growing up, I got paddled a lot, all right? My dad actually, I don't know why, I must have been a little bit worse than my brother. He broke two paddles on me when I was growing up. And so he paddled me frequently. And my dad... Every single time, without fail, every time he punished me, he would look at me and he'd make this statement, I love you. I love you. And I used to think, man, you got a funny way of showing it. If you really <laughs> loved me, put the paddle down, you know, let me go out with my friends or something like that. But what my dad was showing me that was that his punishment was a demonstration of his love. And my dad loved me so much that he wanted to protect me from myself and he wanted to protect me from my sinful nature and he wanted to help me to become the man that God wanted me to be. And so out of love, he punished me. That's what David's saying. God, I don't get what you're doing. God, please don't let my enemies triumph over me. Have you forgotten about me? But God, no matter what, I will trust in your hesed, in your covenant, in your loyal love. Because I know you love me more than I can even begin to comprehend. You see, your trust, my trust, must be founded upon God's loyal love. The writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews 12, 6. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastises every son whom he receives. So David says this, your trust must be founded upon God's loyal love. And then he says it a second way in verse 6. He said, your trust must be founded upon God's generous hearts. Notice verse 6. I will sing to, to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. The idea of singing there is is David demonstrating. It's a confident demonstration of trust. God, I don't understand what is taking place, but I will trust you. No matter what takes place, I will trust you, and I will demonstrate my trust by singing to you. Why? Because you have dealt bountifully with me. What does that show? It shows that God has a generous heart. The word bountifully is a a descriptive word of God's generosity. And let me just say today, I don't know the situation of every single person here, but I know that I can confidently say this. God has been extremely generous to you this morning. God has been extremely generous to you this morning. Do you believe that? Ah, but Brian, there's things that I want that he's not giving me. (laughs) 
Maybe he knows you better than you know yourself. Maybe he's not giving it to you because it wouldn't be beneficial to you. But every single one of us have received bountifully from God. He gives us more than we need. David says, God, I will trust in you because you have been extremely generous to me. Here's what I'm I'm saying today. God longs for us to communicate with him. Just as a spouse longs to know the hearts of her husband or his wife, just as in a relationship you long for that intimate communication, God longs for us to intimately communicate with him. I said the walk away point this way, by crying out to God in lament, you learn to process your pain in a way that helps you to turn to God in faith. Let me say that again. By crying out to God and lament, you learn to process your pain in a way that helps you to turn to God in faith. You can trust that He is the only one who truly understands and thus is the only one who is able to come to your rescue. Share your heart with God. So probably about Six months ago, I was going through a difficult time. Last year was a, was a tough year for us without getting too specific. All, all three of us were in the hospital. I was in the hospital with heart issues. Vicki was in the hospital with back issues. And Amber had four surgeries last year. It, it was a difficult time for us. And I was having a hard time processing it. You said, wait a second, Brian, you're a pastor. You're supposed to be able to process these things. I was having a hard time processing it. I was struggling. Then on top of all of that, you know, Mark, our oldest son, got cancer. Or our youngest son got cancer. And it was just overwhelming to me. So I sat down with a Christian counselor, a friend, Dr. Norm Wise. And I just opened up my heart. And I said, Norm, I need help. I'm struggling. I'm not struggling with my faith. I think my faith is strong, but I'm having a hard time processing these things. And he he, he asked me something that I'd never been asked before. He said, have you ever written your own psalm of lament? And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm not even sure I know what that is. Secondly, no, I've never written that. He said, Brian, I I'd encourage you to take some time reading the lament psalms and then sit down in your own way and write your lament psalm to God. He said, I think that'll help you. So I said, okay, and went back and in my prayer time was reading through the lament psalms. And I sat down one day, probably when we were going through our deepest struggle, we didn't know exactly what was going on with Mark and Amber was still struggling with chronic pain. And I wrote this, my psalm of lament. So can I be raw with you today? This is, this is my communication with God. And I wrote this. O oh Lord, in you we do trust. We have committed our lives to you. Yet your response to us is a life filled with troubles. Life pounds us with trial after trial. We're weary, both emotionally And physically. Have you forgotten us, O Lord? Have you seen the commitment of our family? Please, God, don't abandon us in our weakness. Please don't neglect us in our moment of need. In our brokenness, we cry out to you. Hear our cry. Answer our prayer. Let us see your power, feel your strength, and experience healing and victory. Our faith is grounded in you. You are our only hope, our refuge, and our healer. We rest in your omniscience. We depend upon your omnipotence. We submit to your sovereign will. O Lord, to you we vow that though our health fail, though our strength fade, though our resources vanish, we will fully trust in you. With our thoughts, our lips, and our lives, We will praise you as long as we live. That's what I wrote to God. 
You say, Brian, do you still struggle? Sometimes I do. There's things that God allows to happen in my life that I don't understand. I wish, I wish God would tell me why he allows things to happen. He's chosen not to. But me verbalizing my pain, being honest and sincere with God, not pretending that I have it all together. Okay, God, I'm a pastor. I, I get it. I have it all together. I don't have it all together. I struggle. And I'm allowed to share that with God. And I'm allowed to share my heart with Him. And just doing that has been a process that has helped me to heal and it's helped me to go through some of the struggles that we have been going through. Why do I share that with you today? I share that with you today because you have a God in heaven who loves you more than anything else. A God in heaven who longs to have a personal, intimate relationship with you. A God who longs to hear from you, not in a rehearsed, canned way, but a God who wants to hear the longings, the hurt, the desires of your hearts. And then he wants to lovingly embrace you. And he wants to show you. And he wants to care for you in a way that you realize that you are important to him. This has been really helpful to me. My faith has grown and my faith has strengthened as I've learned that I can cry out to God in pain. And by the way, I, I got to end this way. The answer to all of our pain is not that God removes the pain because he doesn't always remove the pain. The answer to our pain is Jesus. He's the answer to our pain. And God understands everything that you and I are going through. Because by the way, he lost his own son for us. You can share your heart with God. And we want to help you, we want to help us this year that as we learn to pray, we can take the very words of Scripture, the very patterns of Scripture, and we can cry out to God. I trust you'll do that. Would you stand with me this morning? Our, our, our leaders are going to come, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper in just a moment, so I'm going to ask them if they would come and, and take their places. Jonas and the team are going to come. So, so before we ever jump into the Lord's Supper, let me say this. I want to say this. I trust that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're here today and there's never been a time in your life when you have confessed your sins and you have by faith reached out to Jesus Christ and trusted his finished work on the cross, I would encourage you to do that. That's where, the, that's where we begin, right where you are. You could pray just a simple prayer. Lord, please be merciful to me, a sinner. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. And by faith, I trust in Jesus Christ. If you've never done that, I'd encourage you to do that. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer and you're hurting. Nobody might know that you're hurting because you do a really good job of pretending like you're not. You're hurting. Reach out to God. Cry out to God. Bear your soul to God and allow Him to minister to you in a way that only he can. Father, thank you so much for the honesty of men and women of the Bible. Thank you that David shows us that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to have it all together in order to be your followers. We can be broken. Father, we can be hurting within. We can need help. We can be in pain. But help us to realize that as we reach out to you, the answer to our pain is Jesus. And we can trust in an omniscient, omnipotent God who loves us, who cares for us, who is generous to us, who always wants the best for us. We can trust in him. Help us to realize that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.